Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Chen Xu Tan, and today my teammate like Sean and I would like to talk about like cloud native data and model access management for machine learning uh, in the uh, AI domain. So for here, uh, I would like to give you folks a quick introduction about Sean and I. Uh, currently, I'm working as a staff research scientist at Alasio, and I also is a Presto committer contributing to the open source distributed SQL engine. And Sean is currently the software engineer at Alasio, and he is also the Fluid Apache product uh, committer. And here is the agenda of our session today. Uh, generally, like we, we have a pretty long, uh, long uh, list of uh, points that we want to cover. At first, I want to talk about the machine learning in the cloud. What is the current pattern? What is the current architectural design about it? And then Sean will come to discuss about, like, say, how to access data and models in the cloud. And he will present the existing uh, solutions and evaluate the pros and cons of each design. And then he will propose a new design with a lawsuit for the unified data access and model access. And then he will also talk about uh, the cloud native Kubernetes operator and CSI fuse driver all on Kubernetes. And then I will come back and talk about the data access man management for PyTorch and Ray and see how a the unified data access could help to improve the training efficiency. And finally, uh, we'll give some uh, use cases that we have learned from partnership. Yeah. So let's begin. Uh, the first topic we want to cover is machine learning in the cloud. And here is the general architectural design about machine learning system in a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud system. Let's say there are generally like three parts in this diagram. On the very left, there is a training platform, and it could be in an on-prem data center or in a cloud. And then in the middle, it is the storage layer. It could be like different object stores or like say uh, HDFS, this kind of archival storage. And generally, during the training, the training cluster will read the data from the remote storage and run the, run, uh, the, the necessary training jobs in the training clusters. And after the training job is completed, they, they will write back models into the remote, remote storage for the model storage. And then on the right side, there's a serving platform. For the serving, they will get, or say, fetch the models from the remote storage and serve them in the serving cluster. And there is a very uh, clear like, uh, signal of the separation of compute and storage tiers in this kind of uh, design. The, the training cluster could be in one data center or in the cloud A. And then for the serving cluster, it could be in another data center or in another cloud. So that's the design. And here, uh, we want to talk about the data and model access patterns. Like say, in the mach machine learning domain, what, is, what are the traffic patterns to access the data sets and the models? And here is a pretty large table, and we want to focus on mainly two parts of it. Uh, the first one is about the model training and what is the access pattern about that. Generally, we put them into three categories, computer vision jobs, na uh, natural language processing jobs, and checkpoint writes. And for the first two types, though, uh, mostly they are like a reading, reading data set. For computer visions, mostly it could be some images or videos. So the, the typical pattern of this type of data set is uh, there's a very large number of small files, and generally the files are read sequentially. And for the natural language processing, well, what we have ob observed is that for this type of data set, there could be like a, a not that large number of files, but there could be a medium level, a medium number of files, but those files could be e extremely large. And generally during the training, the access pattern wouldn't be a sequential read, but it's mostly a random read, especially when using like parallel to read these types of data sets. And generally for the training side, our target is to maximize the throughput, maximize the read performance from the storage, and maximize the GPU usage here. And what about the model access pattern, especially used in serving? And here for this 
uh, diagram, we zoom into the model access pattern a, a, a little bit here. And we have like model deployment, model inference, all in the like model serving domain. And generally for this type of access, it is still read and mostly the sequential read that we need to read a whole like, like model into the serving, serving cluster. And so, but for this type of thing, what our target would be like, we want to minimize the latency, uh, latency to load the, data, load the data set. I want to get a high concurrency in the model loading part. And then uh, I think I will introduce Sean to talk about like say how to all excise the data and models in the cloud and what are the existing solutions and their trade-offs. So let's first talk about uh, what are some existing solutions for accessing data and models. So for data access, we apparently can directly read them from the cloud storage. And second, uh, we can also, before the training job, we can copy the data set from the cloud to the local machine. And the third way would be using a local cache layer. And we can also use a distributed cache system. And for model access, the most common way we see is just to pull the models directly from the cloud storage after uh, training is done and the model has been written into the cloud. So now we look at uh, zoom in and look at them one by one. So for for the case where we always read from cloud storage, this is the easiest to, to easiest way to set up. But at the same time, the performance is not ideal. Of, of, for the model access, apparently, um, because there uh, there could be multiple, say, um, mo de deploy multiple servers for the models. So each time a server is started, the model has to be repeatedly pulled from the cloud storage. And for training data, because uh, because the training data sometimes, as Trinity mentioned, can be small files. In fact, we, we sometimes see reading data can take more time than actual training. And this is a uh, screenshot of our, one of our experiments done by using PyTorch. We can see the data loader actually takes 82% of the, all the time. And apparently, we don't want to see the bottleneck appear on the I.O. path. Now, to, lo to, make the lo to make reading data faster, we can certainly, instead of reading from cloud, if we copy them before the training to the local, now we can have a lack of much faster access and also less cost because the data is there. We don't have to always read them across different epochs. But then the man data management is a hard problem because the disk space is apparently limited. After using the data set or after this model is outdated, we always must manually delete them. Otherwise, there's no space for the next batch of training or uh, reading data. But at the same time, the local storage is kind of limited because the data, data set, if data is growing, the, the size of data set is growing faster. It's, it's like very, very huge. The local disk may not cache all the files, so although we do have some data can be faster, uh, can be accessed faster, but it's kind of limited. Now, if we use a local cache layer for data reuse, for example, uh, S3 has their S3 FS built in local cache, and Luxo has Fuse SDK. Now, the, re the reuse data is local, so after reading once, those data are cached locally. So when we reuse them, uh, we get faster access and less cost. And now because of this um, cache layer, they can help with the data management. They can do um, basically cache eviction after the, f uh, the cache layer is full. So there's no more manual deletion of the data or any supervision. But the same problem is the cache space is limited because we are depending on the local disk. We can, we can also use a uh, distributed cache system. So for Alexio 2.x, we use a traditional master worker architecture. 
So the data are cached on worker nodes, and the metadata is cached on master nodes. So whenever there's a client needs to read data, we, uh, the client needs to ask master first for where the file, where the data is, and then ask worker for the data. Now, for both training data and uh, models, we can keep them in the cache system in the worker nodes. So this is a perfect unified solution for both reading training data and training the models. And a cache system have some additional data management functionalities. For example, we can preload the data. We can also there's more like pin, pin the data so that it won't get evic evicted. Uh, some more functionalities like those. But then we have the problem that masters now, although we do have a high availability functionality based on uh, Raft, but there are still single point of failure. Well, what I mean is if masters is down, the client, when client needs to read data, it cannot get the metadata or say where the data is in the worker. So there's no way for the client to get the data anymore. So now masters are the single point of failure. And as the file number grow fastly, uh, this problem is more and more severe that makes the masters the bottleneck of the overall performance. So to sum, uh, to sum up, a few challenges we see in this accessing the data in the cloud. The first is performance. If we, uh, so apparently putting data from cloud storage is hurting both training and serving. And the cost. Repe repeatedly requesting data from cloud storage is costly. Uh, both, uh, uh, both metadata and data APIs would cost money too if we, we need to read them. And the third is the reliability because availability is the key for every service in the cloud. And data management is another problem where manual work is unfavorable. Now let's talk about the new design with Alexio. So earlier we see that master is the bottleneck Master is the bottleneck for the performance, both because um, when there's a huge amount of files, retrieving metadata is uh, very slow on masters, and because of the, um, the uh, reliability of the master part. So now we use consistent hashing to cache both data and metadata on workers instead of the metadata on masters. Oh, so by, say, uh, consistent hashing, basically you, the client can calculate where the, 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 where the data is on which worker by the file name. And worker nodes, because we can scale them up pretty easily, they, ha they ha have plenty of space for cache. So training data and the models only need to be pulled once from the cloud storage, and later on, whenever um, either training or serving needs them again, they can directly read from workers. So this is, we are uh, using less cost. And there's no more single point of failure because master is now um, not serving any uh, traffic. We get better reliability and there's no more performance bottleneck on masters. This greatly increased our performance on reading data. And we also get the data management system. So in implementing this in the Alexio 3X, we get high scalability. So one worker can easily support 30 to 50 million files, and they scale linearly. And we can easily support 10 billions of files, which is nowadays pretty common in the machine learning and AI workloads. We also can achieve high, ability, high availability. We can guarantee a 99, uh, four and nine uptime and there's no single point of failure in the system. And we can get faster data loading in the preload stage. 
And for cloud native Kubernetes scenarios, we also have operator and CSI fields for the data access management. And now let's talk about these two uh, parts. So for, for Alexa operator, on this diagram on the bottom, we have cloud uh, VMs and Kubernetes installed on those VMs. And on top of those, we have the Alexa operator, which manages the life cycle of Alexa clusters and data sets. So on top of operator would be Alexa cluster. And then on top of the Alexa cluster, we have training frameworks, which will read the data from Alexa cluster. And the cluster already sits outside of this, uh, more, more of the, um, the com uh, sits outside of the compute side. So for Alexa cluster CRD, the custom resource definition, uh, it, follow, it follows the Kubernetes operator pattern. So on user side, they first create the cl Alexa cluster and data set CRs, uh, CRs, which basically means they submit a uh, configuration to the Kubernetes API server, which then inform those configurations to the Alexa operator. Upon receiving this um, configurations or CRs, a lot of operator will in turn modify and manage Kubernetes resources, which involves creating a lot of cluster, monitor a lot of cluster, um, creating the data set bounded with the Alexio, and do uh, mod depending on the state of the current, current cluster, we'll do corresponding stuff. And then we repeat this cycle, or we call it reconcile, and re basically re repeatedly compare the current status of the cluster with the desired state of the cluster. And if there's a mismatch, we'll do something. And with, with the Alexa operator tool, we can achieve zero downtime upgrade, high availability, and auto scaling. So with the operator, we can achieve a fully managed cache. With this simple Python code, we can easily preload the data, either training data or models, into an Alexa cluster. And all data can, will get evicted if the cache space is full according to uh, the eviction policy, so there's no more manual work of deleting the existing or uh, unused data. And a lot of server will take the job to read and cache from the cloud storage if there's some, any cache miss. So now let's talk about the Alexio CSI fuse driver. So first, about Alexio Fuse. Alexio Fuse is able to expose the Alexio file system as a local file system. And so users can directly access the cloud storage just as accessing a local storage. For example, we can easily do a cat or LS on the, uh, on, inside the directory. And we can simply, uh, easily do an open file. This is a, py a simple Python code. We can just treat the the, the cloud, the files in a cloud storage just as a local storage. This has very, very low impact for the end users. And here's a, story, uh, here's a screenshot of a, uh, this is basically my uh, S3 bucket. You can see we, uh, I call it LS and it just shows on, in the terminal just as a local file system. And for uh, CSI, for Kubernetes, CSI is the container storage interface. So before we have CSI for, uh, before we have CSI for Kubernetes, every storage provider, for example, um, AWS, EBS, and Azure, they have to write their own code to implement the Kubernetes uh, volume interface so that Kubernetes pods is able to use them as a storage. But then this raises the problem of their code ha can only be used after Kubernetes uh, releases. So this uh, make the 
made a collaboration between them very cumbersome because one side has to follow the, um, the timeline of the other side and there's uh, a lot of communication between. But after the CSI comes in, the CSI is basically one type of volume and then if anyone implements the CSI interface, they can just plug in as the CSI and become the volume for uh, Kubernetes pods, which separates the development cycles and would make the, um, the, the implementation and the, um, the release much easier for both sides. So now there's more than 100 existing CSI drivers. For example, AWS EBS, Azure Disk, Azure File, and of course we have the Luxio CSI driver. So if we combine them together for data access, Alexio Fuse is able to turn the remote cloud data set into local folder for training. And SSI is able to launch uh, Alexio Fuse pod only when the data set, data set is needed. So which means if the training is now started or the applica the, uh, we don't need the Fuse process to be there, um, sometimes this can take uh, some resources that the cluster manager, uh, the cluster maintainer doesn't want to see. So with this setup, we have three layers of caching. So first, with the kernel fields, we have the kernel cache. This is the fastest. And then with the Luxio fields, we have the local cache for the training node. And lastly, we have the Luxio server distributed cache that sits inside the compute, inside the compute um, cluster, serving um, data as cache, but it's still much faster than accessing data from cloud. So on the right side, um, this diagram shows a, uh, the architecture of how application pod can access the, Alexio, uh, the, access the data in, from Alexio Fuse. So on this host machine, the application pod is basically just the training pod where the training Python or uh, whatever training is running. And it uses the persistent volume and persistent volume claim to be mounted inside itself so that it can see the data inside this persistent volume claim. And then a Luxio Fuse container runs uh, the Luxio Fuse process which mounts the, da the data inside Alexio onto the host machine so that by this two-step uh, two mount, the application pod is able to see the data stored, uh, the data exposed by the Alexio fields process. All right, now I'll hand back to Chen Xu to talk about the data ac access management. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Sean. And, uh, so here I come back again and talk about, like, like Sean has talked about the unified caching layer for data and model access. Like how, would that be really helpful in production use cases? Like say, could we get some results from some evaluation? And that's my job here to talk about, like say, there are some ex experiments that we have done with this new design and we have already gotten some like significant results that we want to share here today. So the, the, the first section about the a, experimental result we have to share is about using it, integrating it, this kind of solution with PyTorch. So here is the general design that we integrated a lasso with PyTorch for the training. And say on the very left side, there is the training node. And for example, here we have a PyTorch cluster to run the training job. And then we have a cache client installed in this training node with PyTorch. So the cache client has a, a, a affinity block location policy, so it can help to when a data would be needed by a, a piece of data is needed by PyTorch, it could know like which uh, target cache worker uh, it needs to talk to to get the, the, this kind of file. And then uh, we have a service registry in the middle in the cache cluster to serve for the service recover, uh, discovery. So when the, the cache client could get the cluster information from there and then talk to that specific cache worker to get that data file. If that data file has been cached in the cache worker, the data file will be directly returned to the cache client and then feed it to the PyTorch training node. 
But if it is not there, it will get the file from the end of storage, like different object store or different storage medium, and then get it back and return it to the cache client. So this is a general design about like how to integrate Elasio with PyTorch. And we, uh, we want to say here that it, this is just an example of Elasio, but if we use another type of cache, generally the idea would be the same. And here is the, some data loading performance that we have collected. Uh, still, as we have discussed, there are two categories of data set for training. One is computer vision, and the other is natural language processing. So still, we compare those two types of data sets here. On the left side, we compare the computer vision like training data loading IOPS. So the data set is the, uh, the very popular image net, and we use a subset of it. And then what we could gotten from the result is that Elasio Fuse has the highest performance than S3 Fuse and AWS S3. And for the AWS S3 here, we use the Boto API, the Python API here. And for the right side, we, do some, we did some comparison about different types of APIs, different types of data loading for natural language processing data set. And we used the Yelp review data set here. And what we have observed is that uh, the Elasio RESTful API and the Elasio S3 API provide a better performance over the others. And also, like when we do the training, we really care about the GPU usage of the training job because nowadays GPU is a very important resources that we really want to maintain a high usage of it. So here is an example that we ran the, ran the uh, PyTorch ResNet mechanism on the ImageNet dataset that we train this kind of job there. And we used the S3 fuse to help us to fetch the data from S3. And here is the result. Uh, we could see that the GPU usage here is only around like 17%. So most of the time, actually the training, the whole training, most of the time is spent on loading the data set from S3. So what we can observe on the middle like green block is that like say around like 82% of the total training time is spent on the data loading section. And with the Elasio Fuse, we can improve that dramatically. Like say still the same training pipeline, just that we used Elasio Fuse here, and we could see that the data loader rate, the proportion of data loading has been reduced from 82% to only around like 1% here. And the GPU usage has been improved from 17% to 93% here, so five times improvement. So that's an example that we integrated this kind of data access solution with PyTorch. And here we want to give you folks another like, example of integrating it with Ray. Uh, so before we jump into the experimental results, uh, I want to give you folks a quick idea about what is Ray. Uh, Ray itself current, uh, nowadays is gaining like, popularity in the machine learning domain. It is designed mainly for distributed training, distributed compute. So itself uses a distributed scheduler to help to distrap, uh, di di dispatch training jobs to available workers. There could be CPU, there could be GPU. So for users, generally, we can just uh, write some like still like single-threaded uh, code, but RAIL will interpret it and distribute this kind of job in a distributed pattern. So Ray help us to horizontally scaling for the training jobs across mul mul uh, multiple nodes. And also it provides uh, a data abstraction for customers to use. Uh, so for users, we can very easily write some Ray jobs for distributed machine learning training. And here is how we integrated like Elasio into the Ray ecosystem. Generally, Ray as a unified like distributed compute layer it uses like different machine learning training frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it mainly has like a, in Ray, it mainly has like a train, uh, train, serve, and tune modules. And then when, on usually the data is, all the models is stored in, uh, in a re the storage layer, the, the very bottom layer uh, in this diagram. And then Elasio could provide a unified like high performance data access layer 
uh, to read the data, to load the, uh, I'll say preloaded the uh, data and models into Alasio and feed it to the upper like training or serving framework. And this, this is the design, like how we integrated uh, with in integrated Alasio into Ray. So integrated a, a, a unified caching layer into the Ray ecosystem. In Ray, generally, uh, the data load loading is uh, is taken care of by a module called Ray Data Loader. Uh, so, and Ray Data Loader uses PyArrow to read the data files. And with PyArrow, the PyArrow itself uses the FSBAC as an interface to talk to different uh, data sources. And so, what we have done is that we like created uh, Alasso's FSBAC implementation. We, which we uh, implemented the interfaces like a RAID file with open file, a list directory, et cetera, et cetera. And this implementation talks to the Elasio Python client. And Elasio Python client talks to the RESTful API servers in the worker nodes of the Elasio cluster. And here is, we also have an ETC cluster here. Uh, it is resp uh, for, for Alasio workers, they register their worker information into the ETC cluster, and then the Alasio Python client could talk to the ETC cluster to get the worker addresses. So when uh, like the Ray wants to load a specific data file, the Python client will, could determine like, which worker it should talk to to get this piece of like, data file. So this is the design. And how about the results? Uh, what about some uh, evaluation results? Whether we could get some improvement with this kind of design? And here, this is a benchmark on some small files. On the small, uh, small files here, uh, mainly referring to some small images. Like the experiment was done based on the data set of the ImageNet data set. We used the 130 gigabyte uh, ImageNet data set. And we, there are some uh, settings on the, on the right side. Like say we have like four uh, ray train workers, nine process rating. And uh, generally what, what we have observed is that the active uh, object store me uh, memory ranges from 400 to 500 megabytes. And on the left side, we show a diagram here about the, the throughput, the images per second that we can load in ray. Uh, so we compare, we directly read it from S3 uh, so that's the uh, blue bars, and also like say, what if we load, use Ray to load the data set from Alasio, that is the red bars. And what we could observe is that when the object store memory is pretty high, like say four gigabytes, uh, directly from S3 versus Alasio, they have pretty similar performance. And if we have a limited memory here, like say only have a few hundred, megabytes for, for Ray to, for the uh, Ray's object store, we could see that Alasio has a higher performance uh, regarding the throughput. So that's about some small files, that's only one type of data set. Like what about some, the other type? What about the files are pretty large and they could be in different data formats, like very popular column oriented data format like Parquet, right? So here is another benchmark that we have done. Like say, for the, the data set, still the ImageNet data set, but, but we uh, put them into some large parquet files. In general, each parquet file is around like 200 megabytes, and in total, there are around like 60 gigabytes of the data set. So there are like 28 ray tra training workers, uh, 28 process rating, and what we could observe from the diagram is that we could see that generally Alasio directly loading the parquet files from Alasio uh, in Ray has a better performance, have uh, a better performance over directly loading them from S3 into, uh, into Ray. So uh, Alasio is a red, uh, red line here and the S3 is a blue line. And also, uh, if you folks remember that Sean has also talked about some cost. Say when we fetch, say in a multi-cloud platform, let's say we have a training cluster in the on-premises environment, but we have a cloud storage for the data set and the model storage. Then every time for the training or for the serving, we retrieve the data set or the models from the remote storage, that will cause an egress cost. So that will be a data transfer fees uh, uh, like uh, 
needed by the uh, cloud provider, by the vendors. So generally, with this kind of a caching layer, it can also help us to reduce the egress fee here. So here, for example, there are generally two diagrams. Uh, it's mainly about the cache itself. One is a cache miss, and the other is a cache hit. So it shows that one, we could have a high, pretty high cache hit, then we could save a really large number of API calls from the cloud. So because with a very high cache, uh, cache rate uh, percentage, generally all the calls here, like the list status call, the get calls, all of these API calls will only access the caching layer instead of the cloud storage. And the caching layer has already cached, or say preload the data sets and the models in the cache, so they could directly feed the data and the models back to the training cluster or the serving cluster. So that will save a very high number of API calls from the cloud side. And finally, uh, I want to talk about some use cases. Uh, actually, this is not uh, something that's very new, that we have collaborated with different companies in this kind of design and in this uh, type of evaluation. So here, uh, we want to share a, a very practical use case, a very practical story, like how to use this approach to really fit it into a production level machine learning pipeline. So here is, uh, a diagram of the basic like uh, design, architectural design of a real like machine learning pipeline in a company. Uh, so generally, this is a design before we use the caching mechanism. This is the, the, their like a previous design. Generally, they have two different model training clusters. One model training cluster mainly runs the PyTorch jobs, and the PyTorch jobs like fetch the training data from the object storage. And they also have another training cluster, and that training cluster ran, runs uh, Spark jobs. And from the Spark jobs, they get the training data from HDFS. And both the, those two types of training jobs, like PyTorch jobs and Spark jobs, uh, write their models back to HDFS. So that's about the model training. And then on the right, this is about like a model serving. A model serving, they have a model deployment cluster that will help to uh, fetch the latest models from the HDFS and then serve it to, for, for like continuous serving, like say model inference, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, uh, they have different applications in the company and those applications will send some API calls to the model serving cluster to use the, to use the mo uh, models to pre for prediction and forecasting. And there are three issues that they have reported in their previous design. The first one is a very low GPU utilization in the PyTorch side. That's the one problem. Because they have to repeatedly uh, like read the data from the object storage. And the other side, the, 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 other, uh, the next problem is about the overloaded storage in the HDFS side. So lots of things, uh, so this makes the HDFS cluster a bit unstable, unstable during that time. And another problem is about the network congestion here uh, because the model deployment cluster will need to very frequently try to lo repeatedly load the models from the HDFS side. This caused uh, some like uh, net network congestion in their, in their like, uh, data system. And then what we have done with them is that through the collaboration, we uh, adopted like Alasso into their production environment and it solved those problems. Say for the PyTorch training jobs and Spark training jobs, we, they both now have uh, Alasso as a unified data access layer to help to cache the training data and feed the training data to the training jobs. And also for the model serving side, we also have uh, Alasso as a, a model cache that it can preload the models into Alasso as a cache layer and feed the models to the, 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 the model deployment cluster. So what we, can, we have uh, observed from this production environment is that we can get higher GPU usage, around like two times. Uh, there's no network congestion now for the, the uh, uh, model serving. Uh, and also we have seen like a faster uh, model rollout here. There's around like 10 times compared with the previous design. Yep. Uh, I think that's, that's all 
for our like session today. Uh, any questions or anything that you want to ask us? Yeah. Okay. Is, is this open? Yeah, sorry, I didn't quite understand how um, the data path works from your caching layer to to the uh, worker pro like the the pod process. Is that going over a network or is it going through like I like the actual I/O subsystem of the system? Like, are you basically, are you copying to some sort of block device on the system when you're caching, and then that's being loaded by the pod? And in which case, how do you make sure that the data that that you that particular pod is training on, you, you, you had like um, you know multi replication of of the cache layer, but it looked like maybe it was possible for a pod over here would be trying to load a piece of data that's on the cache on this other worker. Is that correct? Uh, uh, let me re maybe repeat. Re re well. Yeah, uh, let me repeat your question first. Uh, so, from my understanding, your question is: I say we have a large number of uh, worker nodes, and on the same time, we may have a large number of training nodes. And then the training data may want a piece of data set, and then we have a worker to help it to load it. And then there's maybe another training 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 pod that may also need this data set and ask another worker to to uh, to load it. So there could be some like duplication or miss. A communication between those, those nodes, and you want to know how we handle this kind of problem. It, it, uh, am I understanding it correctly? Essentially, yes. Yeah. But also, I was trying to understand is that data, be the communication between the training node and the worker node, is that just over the network, or is it, can you use other fabrics, or what? Uh, for that, uh, yeah. I think uh, the second question is about like how we commute, what is the communication protocol or the channel between the the worker uh, the the cache worker node and the training node okay yeah uh, so I can I can help you uh, I think I can answer the first question first uh, about the uh, architectural design uh, about the between the training node and the the the, the uh, cache worker node here so the general idea is that. Uh, when we have the, a, a large number of ca cache workers there, so for e for only for one, only one data file, it will be only stored in one specific worker, unless the the customer configures the replicas of this data file. And so, say we have like ten training nodes, and the, the training nodes have like a, they will have like a Python client there. So actually, that will answer your second question. The communication is uh, communicated via the HTTP like channels. Like say we have the Python client talks to the rest of all servers in the cache worker node. So and for the ca the Python client side, it uses a consistent ha hashing because the worker nodes are listed into a hash ring. So and then for if you know the hash ring, there could be different workers, and for one data file, it will be only stored in one worker. And the Python client could know uh, for a specific data file where is that data file is stored. So it will just uh, talk to that specific worker node. So that's the basic mechanism there. Yeah. Okay. Is it open? Yeah. Well, I I have two questions. One one about the performance of S3. I'd like I I would have thought that you would improve also like on on the smaller file size, right? But why is it not improving? Is that basically because that the array itself caches that this has enough memory? That's the first one. And the second one is kind of more a curiosity. I mean, because here we're not like <laughs> It's very technical, but you could have a lot of these pods right, that they are creating the claims. Are they all creating the claims against the same volume? So you create one volume and they all have claims against that volume? Thank you. Okay. Uh, could you repeat the first question? I'm the first question was about when you were comparing the performance of S3 for the two different values of, of memory on array. Why doesn't it improve for the when you have a large memory on Ray, is that because Ray itself caches? Oh, I got your point. I think, yeah. Uh, 
I think that the second one is to you, Sean. Like, do you get? Did you get that? I, yeah, yeah I, I think I, I can answer the first question. Uh, the first question I think you asked about. Uh, you asked about the first case or th this case, the second case. The first one, this one. Okay. Uh, I think the 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 case. I, I think what uh, so. Yeah, I, I think your question is like say, from my understanding, your question is say, for example, when the memory is pretty uh, limited, like Elastio has a higher performance, but why when we have a large amount of me memory, the performance is here is pretty si uh, similar? Yeah, yeah. I think from our e experiments, like uh, say, because for Ray, it also have the object store here. As what you, you mentioned, Ray is object store. You can, we can consider it as another type of cache. Yeah, so it's it will cache the data in the object store here. So, but for Alasio, it can help when there is a very limited memory here because for the Ray object store, it mainly store the data set in the memory side. And when the memory is limited, the data will be spilled to disk. But the performance there is not that like significant. That there will be like a, a version performance. But for Elasio side, we mainly use SSD there. So for SSD for the data storage, that could be uh, pretty fast. Yeah. So that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah. I need to repeat the second question as well. It's it's more a curiosity, and because it doesn't have anything to do with the the performance. But y you had those pods that access uh, Alexio, create these uh, PVCs, the, the claims on the storage. Are they all creating different PVCs on the same PV? So so PV and PVC, they are like a pair, one to one pair, and uh, when uh, Alexio is created, we have this PVC created for them, and PV and P PVC pair for them, and then they just need to mount that PVC into the, uh, their application pod. The, when we say PVC under the hood, is just a uh, path on the host machine. So there's, there's a mount between a lot of fuse pod with the host machine path, so they are like this, basically, you know, that's the same thing. And then this part is also mounted into the application part, so they are the same thing. So, so this is how like the two parts can communicate with each other. Yeah, I I think maybe I didn't catch for the SSD layer for your storage there. Are you using LRU or some other cache scheme? And you know, have you analyzed analyzed what the impact on the SSD drive write you know burn rate is? And whether that costs, you know, basically, you're burning SSDs in order to do this, or? Uh, yes, I, I, I think uh, I think the, the question is mainly about, like, say, the cache eviction policies in this design, and uh, also about, like, say, why we choose SSD for it, right? So, uh, so for the first question, for the cache eviction policies, uh, yes, uh, we have like different like choices here, like say uh, L, R, U, F, L, F, U, etc., etc. But what we have observed in the current use cases, like this is a very basic mechanism, like L, R, U has already been pretty well wo working pretty well in the in the production use cases. So for uh, at this moment, we didn't like. Uh, implement like uh, many more complicated mechanism because the straightforward approaches have been pretty nice have pretty pretty well and the second question is about the ssds right so uh, why we choose ssd over for example memory here is uh, from some very like uh, critical observations from industrial level machine learning workload that nowadays in the training workload for example we have different training nodes right and the training nodes uh, usually have both CPUs and GPUs. 
And some, some companies, they only use CPUs for the training because they don't have enough resources for the uh, GPU provisioning. And no matter which type of design, memory is usually like a very limited or say a very important resources for training because training itself will have already consumed lots of memory resources there. So for the caching mechanism, we have a limited amount of RAM that we can use. So, but SSD has uh, also a better performance over like HDD, over like the previous like uh, uh, disk design. Uh, and at the same time, usually on each training node, they have a pretty large amount of SSD unused there. So that, that's why we choose SSD uh, for the cache storage for data and uh, models. Yeah. Yeah. So any, any other questions? I think, uh, yeah. And uh, thank you. Thank you.